Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcasts to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. It's Saturday the 22nd of July. I'm Jamie East and this was a week that saw by-election drama, Russia and Ukraine tangle over Black Sea grain, wildfires in Europe and tributes to a music and fashion icon. Grab a cup of something hot, put up your feet and get up to speed on the seven biggest stories of the week. This is the Standout 7 from the Smart 7. It's news, but not the news. This week saw Rishi Sunak under huge pressure with three by-elections on Thursday and the risk of an historic loss which might set a grim tone for a general election in 2024. Labour leader Sakir Starmer was out and about campaigning but maintained a cautious tone, particularly when it came to public spending. Uh, A Labour government will always want to invest in its public services but that has to start with responsible economics and it has to be coupled with reform. The three seats up for grabs were Boris's old seat in Uxbridge and South Ryslip in West London along with Selby and Ainsty in North Yorkshire and Somerton and Frome. Despite poor polling and a grim economic outlook, Rishi Five pledges Sunak was staying upbeat. You know, midterm by-elections for incumbent governments are always difficult. I don't expect these to be any different. But I passionately believe that my priorities are the country's priorities. But also they should be reassured that I'm working day and night to deliver on them. The run into the by-elections got bumpy for Labour, though, as Keir Starmer's refusal to lift the Tory two-child benefit cap attracted fierce criticism from within his own party and from the SNP, Stephen Flynn. I find it utterly bizarre, deeply shameful and deeply regrettable that the Labour Party are in a position where they're in agreement, full agreement, with the Conservatives on this. Shadow Work and Pension Secretary Jonathan Ashworth was quick to defend the policy and said because of the current level of interest rates and the state of the economy, they'll have to step carefully on public spending. We've got to be really disciplined and we cannot make unfunded spending commitments. So Keir Starmer and our Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves have been very clear we are not changing policy on this. Wednesday saw the economy gods smile down on Rishi on the eve of the by-elections as he finally got some good news. For the first time since January, inflation was below the level expected by the markets, dropping by almost a full percentage point to 7.9%, a stat which left Chancellor Jeremy Hunt happy and cautiously optimistic. It's obviously welcome news that inflation has fallen uh, and it shows that if the government and the Bank of England are prepared to take difficult decisions we can win the battle against inflation. Then, early Friday morning, we got the results of the three by-elections, and things didn't turn out quite as pundits expected as everyone got a seat. The Lib Dems took Somerton and Frome, overturning a 19,000 Conservative majority. Labour made history by winning Selby, overturning a 20,000 Tory majority and marking the biggest swing in by-election history. But just as dramatically, the Tories held on to Boris's old seat in Uxbridge by a mere 495 votes, as a protest over London Mayor Sadiq Khan plan to expand ULES. Brand new Tory MP, not a phrase we're expecting to hear often, Steve Tuckwell said his super slim majority is a protest vote. The people here have been telling me that this has been a referendum on ULES and it clearly has. And now that that message has come through loud and clear. You know, the ULES expansion, the determination to to wreck businesses, the determination to cost families £4,500 a year has cost Labour the election this evening. Labour's win in Selby sees Keir Mather at just 25 become the youngest MP in the Commons and he was firmly on message as he made his victory speech. In a year's time, I believe we will be on the precipice of a Labour government a mission-driven Labour government to transform the country, make fairer choices and empower communities across our region. The Lib Dems were so confident of their win in Somerton and Frome that they declared victory for Sarah Dyke just 90 minutes after polls closed. And Lib Dem MP Christine Jardine had a pretty chilling message for Rishi Sunak. Winning here takes something like a 15% swing. There are 30 Conservative seats that are within 10%. So if we can achieve this sort of result here we can win in other places as well. 
America's decision to send Ukraine cluster bombs caused controversy this week. The deadly explosives, which open in midair to release numerous smaller bombs, are banned in over 100 countries under an international convention, but not in Ukraine, Russia or the US. Ukraine's promise the bombs will primarily be used to clear minefields, but Russian President Putin said Moscow's ready to retaliate if the devices are used. Russia has a sufficient supply of various types of cluster munitions. We have not used them so far. There was no such need. But if they are used against us, we reserve the right to mirror actions. Ukraine was also busy with a maritime drone attack on the Kerch Bridge, which connects occupied Crimea and Russia. The explosion damaged the bridge's structure and was condemned by Russia as a terrorist incident. That attack may have influenced Russia's decision to withdraw from the UN-sponsored Black Sea Grain Deal, which could have huge impact on food supplies to Africa and food prices across the world. On Monday night, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken condemned the withdrawal, calling it unconscionable. So, the result of Russia's action today, weaponizing food, using it as a tool, as a weapon in its war against Ukraine, uh, will be to make uh, food harder to come by in places that desperately need it. This should be restored as quickly as possible. And I hope that every country is watching this very closely. And Germany's Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock weighed in too, saying Russia's decision not to extend the deal has shocked the world and she feels Germany will do whatever it can to help resolve the situation. Because Germany, our country, has been responsible for the most severe crimes uh, in the world in the past. It was and still is our responsibility to strengthen international law in order to prevent future wars, to prevent genocide crimes against uh, humanity. Meanwhile, following the Kerch Bridge attack, the NSC's coordinator for strategic communications, John Kirby, made a significant statement that won't have pleased Vladimir Putin as he recognised that occupied Crimea remains part of Ukraine. We made it clear to the Ukrainians that we won't encourage and we won't enable strikes inside Russia. What we are trying to do and have been for 16 months is making sure that they can defend their own territory. Crimea is Ukrainian soil. Russia continued to hammer Ukrainian cities all week, focusing in particular on ports including Odessa in the wake of the collapse of the Black Sea grain deal. In a peculiar moment, the head of MI6 rather publicly intervened in the war while making a rare speech in Prague. Richard Moore called on Russian defectors to switch sides. Many Russians are wrestling with the same dilemmas as their predecessors did in 1968. I invite them to do what others have already done and join hands with us. Their secrets will always be safe with us. In the week that Rishi and Suella's Stop the Boats bill finally made its way through the Commons and the Lords, there was plenty of controversy over one of the interim solutions to deal with the migrant crisis. The Isle of Portland in Dorset is set to become the first place in the UK to house asylum seekers on the water. The Bibby Stockholm, a three-storey floating barge, arrived in Portland Port, where it'll host up to 500 single men in 222 rooms for the next 18 months. It's been met with protests from both local residents, who claim the town's being used as a dumping ground, and human rights charities, who say the plans are inhumane. This is Tim Nail Hilton from Refugee Action. This barge is a gimmick, it's a distraction, but it's one that has real-world consequences for the people living there. And what we're seeing is that they're living in prison life conditions. And campaigner Lynn Hubbard says it's unacceptable to house refugees on a barge. We don't think they should be on any barge in any part of the country. The Bibby Stock home is designed for 220 people. There will be 500 people on this barge. It's inhumane. Downing Street's defended using barges to house migrants, insisting it's a cheaper alternative to hotels. But Labour aren't impressed, as Shadow Culture Secretary Lucy Powell explained. These barges and things that we're seeing, these are a sign of failure. This is a sign that the backlogs continue, that we need uh, more and more capacity in hotels, in barges and elsewhere to deal with people who are waiting uh, for decisions because that's just not happening. Meanwhile, Nuclear Minister Andrew Bowie doesn't think the barges will be needed for very long. When we get all of these actions in place and we stop the boats, we will no longer need to use things like barges or hotels around the country. That's ultimately where we're aiming to get to. Wildfires are raging across southern Europe as the heatwave continues to ravage the continent. The EU is sending four firefighting aircraft to Greece to help tackle the wildfires which have reduced over 7,000 acres of land to ashes. Meanwhile, the highest temperature so far has been recorded in Sicily at 46.3 degrees Celsius, with temperatures expected to stay elevated for the next week. 
The current heat wave seems to be a warning that climate change is accelerating, and John Narin, the UN extreme heat advisor, wasn't offering any good news. We're in for a bit of a ride, I'm afraid. This comes as the UK releases its national adaptation programme, which Chris Stark, CEO of the UK's Climate Change Committee, says doesn't go far enough. We've been spared these temperatures that are currently being experienced in places like Italy at the moment, but last year, of course, we had that. This is the plan that's supposed to adapt the country to that kind of event uh, now and in the future. And it doesn't quite hit the mark, I'm afraid. Still to come on the Standout 7, apologies for veterans, ice spice on Taylor and tributes to a fashion icon. Right after this. Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcast to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. Welcome back. Wednesday marked an historic day for the LGBTQ plus community with the publication of a long-awaited independent review into the treatment of gay military personnel up to the year 2000. The report revealed shocking evidence of overt homophobia, bullying and sexual abuse at a time when gay people were officially banned from serving. Lord Etherton, who wrote the report, recommended a full apology be made in the House of Commons and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak did so once it was published. The ban on LGBT people serving in our military until the year 2000 was an appalling failure of the British state. As today's report makes clear, in that period many endured the most horrific sexual abuse and violence, homophobic bullying and harassment all while bravely serving this country. The review interviewed LGBT veterans and described what it called appalling consequences for their mental health and well-being and recommended financial compensation for those affected. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace, who served in the armed forces at the time of the ban, also offered his sincere apologies. I cannot imagine what it must have been like to join the armed forces, buoyed up by the great spirit of service and only to discover to your horror that many believe you didn't fit. I cannot imagine what it must have felt like to have been hounded out of a job you loved simply on account of your sexuality. If you've got a Swifty in your household, you'll understand the agony that the Arena's tour is bringing to millions. If you don't know what any of that means, let me translate. Taylor Swift's billion-dollar tour is due to hit the UK and Ireland next summer, and tickets went on sale this week, causing nightmares for one and all. There is one person who still loves Miss Swift, and that's her brand-new collaborator, Ice Spice. She spilled the tea to Zane Lowe on what it's like to text with Tay-Tay. I pulled up to the studio, and she outside waiting for me. I'm like, why is Taylor Swift outside? <laughs> <laughs> so she is great. Like she's so funny. We text all the time. Like she is hilarious. She's funny. Sunday night brought some sad news with the announcement that the British-born French actress and singer Jane Birkin had passed away at the age of 76. Rising to prominence through the 1969 hit single Je t'aime moi non plus alongside her then-partner Serge Gainsbourg, she went on to have a prolific film career which spanned more than five decades. And she was also adored for her personal style, inspiring a famous luxury 35 grand Hermes handbag named the Birkin. Here she is talking about her own version of the bag. Rest in peace, Jane. As it was mine... I just thought it was more fun to hang things off it. So I hang my watch off it and my, all my baubles and bangles and beads. Because when you walk around, they jingle and jangle. So it's a a happy sound. You've been listening to The Smart 7. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. Hit that follow button and have a great day. Give us seven minutes and we'll give you the world. Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcasts to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads.